Good afternoon, everyone. It is so wonderful to have you join us this evening. We just want to welcome you right now to a community conversation focusing on our youth and focused with our youth. So we are so grateful um, to see you. And I also want to um, specifically just share with everyone kind of the purpose of tonight's event. Um, first, my name is Dr. Luchara Wallace. I am the director of the Lewis Walker Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations at Western Michigan University. And um, we are partnering with our WMED, as well as our student organization, um, White Coats for Black Lives, and our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Law Team. So we are so excited to come together tonight to focus on some of the challenges that have been experienced in our communities as it relates to COVID, as well as some of the violence towards Black people that um, have been witnessed and experienced within our communities. And, and we want to just discuss how that relates and connects to the trauma, growth, and um, development of our children. So we're interested tonight in having a community conversation to bring together leaders for discussion. And, um, and our leaders do include our youth. And, from, and in a moment, I'll ask each of our um, I'll ask each of our panelists to please come off of mute and introduce yourselves and share where you're from and um, just a little bit about why this is important for you to be here and in this space tonight. Um, so we're going to learn about um, programs that exist, what supports are available, um, needs that are currently um, prevalent in our communities with our youth, and how we can collaborate to bridge those gaps. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to first um, introduce our youth panelists. We have Ontario from Phoenix High School, Rayon from Lloyd Norix, and Rennell from Kalamazoo Central. So if you can introduce yourselves in that order. I No, I'm, I'm not right. Okay, I did something wrong. So, so Brian, I know Brian's here. So if you could go ahead and introduce yourself, then I'm not completely out of order. And then Stacy, um, with a Y, Jackson is going to introduce <laughs> The rest. Good to see everyone's beautiful faces. I'm Brianne Richards. I'm a senior at Lloyd Norris High School, and I'm from the Kalamazoo area. My dad was on the south side. My lo my mom was on the west side. So um, I, I get around a little bit, a little bit of everywhere. But um, I'm happy to be here because I just I love doing community service, and I love you know getting involved with my black community, like all my friends at school. And I'm heavily involved in Peace Jam, and I just kind of wanted to do something more. And Mr. Aganaga, our principal, I didn't, I wasn't even aware of like anything that you guys had going on. So he just kind of, um, you know, introduced me to this and wanted me to, um, you know, come on here and speak. And I was happy to do it because this is right in my alley. I love, you know, educating myself and educating others when I'm informed on something someone else doesn't know. So I'm just really happy to be here and just listen and talk so yeah welcome Rayon. um i'm gonna um open the mic for renell russell to introduce himself hi everybody um my name is renell russell i'm a freshman at lloyd norks high school uh i'm from the kalamazoo area i think everybody needs to be able to make a change in the community because the recent things that have been happening like everybody's dying to gun violence and all the protests that's been going on for Black Lives Black Lives, and I think that everybody should just come together, make the community better, so we all can be on the right track and same page. Yeah. That's what I think. Thank this. you so much, Renell. We're so glad you're here. Now I'd like to open the mic for our panelists um, to also introduce themselves. Actually, Stacy, do you want to take that part? Oh, I was going to ask Nakinga if there was another student here from Phoenix or not to introduce. Yeah, he was having trouble logging on, our Ontario player. Um, and I know uh, Candace Moore was trying to assist us a little bit. So when he does come on, let's give him space to go ahead and introduce himself. His proud principal is on, Mr. Hill. Um, so we will wait for um, Ontario to go ahead and get connected. 
Awesome. We will do that. So while we're waiting for Ontario to get connected, if I could please, well, we'll just throw the ball back in your court. Nakinga, if you could please introduce yourself and uh, we will just kind of go um, through that order. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nakinga Bergen. I am the Director of Student Services for Kalamazoo Public Schools. Very proud to serve in that capacity. Um, our as many as 13,000 children, I consider them all my own. So I am very thrilled and honored to uh, be here and represent uh, Kalamazoo Public Schools. Thank you. Ms. Stacy Jackson, would you please introduce yourself to the group? <laughs> For the third time. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Wallace. Um, my name is Stacy Jackson, and I am currently a out of school time program development coach with Kalamazoo Youth Development Network. Um, I'm a lifelong Kalamazoo resident, been here my whole life, north side till I die, woo -woo, whatever all that means, right? And um, I'm really thankful to have this opportunity to talk today about, you know, what's, op what's available in our community. Um, a lot of things have us looking at things that are impossible. Well, and everything is, can be possible. We just got to do a little bit different. So I'm excited to be here and to hear from the youth and to um, really so that they can guide our work moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I'd like to also welcome Sakia Lee. Could you please uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. So my name is Sakia Lee. I am the Director of Community Collaboration for the Kalamazoo Promise. Um, I am here uh, as a transplant to the community, but only here because of children and youth. Um, also, with the Promise, we kind of deem it as one of the most equitable scholarships in the world, but we know that without equality and justice, um, what we are offering is going to be so far from reach and achievable for some students if we don't really work with community partners. Um, and so I am here to learn more about what the youth have to say, which is really so important, and um, see how we can partner and work together to make sure that the Promise is obtainable. And, and for folks outside the Promise, we still care about y'all too. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Reverend Mo Brooks, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Mo Brooks. I am also a lifetime Kalamazoo resident. You know, I am also the um, Director of Family Ministries at Mount Zion Baptist Church here in Kalamazoo. And, you know, youth are very important and valuable. And I'm just um, grateful to be a part of this discussion as we talk about um, resources and needs for our youth and families. So, so yeah, keep it short and sweet. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for being here. Um, next, Mr. Mark Hill, could you please introduce yourself? Look, I have a student that's in crisis trying to sign on, and uh, but I'm Mark Hill, principal of Phoenix High School, and I'm just here to be a support, uh, to be, a, be an ear and an advocate uh, and I'm ready to, to work wherever the young people put me. How about that? That is perfect. Thank you so much. Always serving, always taking care of our young people. Thank right. you. Um, we also are, are blessed to have Tamara Custard on tonight, TC. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, so I am Tamara Custer, better known by TC. Uh, I am not only a community activist as well as a youth advocate, um, but I am hoping to serve the community on a larger scale in the clinical mental health field as well as school counseling soon. So uh, I am happy to be invited back and uh, see how we can bridge those gaps together and, and collectively. So uh, thank you, Dr. Wallace. I can't even talk, Dr. Wallace, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for being here. That's all right. We, we understand. It's, it's, it's been a deep, intense uh, week, month, year, so we get it. It's not a problem. Um, the next couple folks we're going to introduce are a part of our planning committee, and, I, um, and they're going to be kind of on the panel, but also shared in moderation and bringing questions to us this evening. So we've got um, retired Captain Stacy Ledbetter. Thank you, Doc. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Stacy Ledbetter, as you heard. And so I'm representing 
Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation. I'm a racial healing practitioner. So like Zakia was saying, I'm looking forward to listening tonight to our young people, but here's a partner, here's a supporter. I'm a transplant also, I'm a native Detroiter, but came to Western when I was 17. So started here as a young person. So I wanna hear about those generation gaps. We've been in the community over 30 years and just excited to hear from you all. So thank you, thank you, Doc. Thank you for being here. Next, I would like to ask Andrew. Andrew, could you, Andrew Gray, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Andrew Gray. I'm a second year medical student at WMed. Um, I am the leader of White Coats for Black Lives at the med school. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I'm really excited to hear from uh, some of the kids. Um, I just wanted to say that I was actually just talking to my niece who just turned 18 and she voted in her very first election this year. And I just want to say like, sometimes, you know, these kids really surprise you with like their insights and like how like in tune they are. So yeah, I'm excited for some of that. I'm excited for the space and excited to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you for your vision for helping to bring all of us together, Andrew. And finally, our partner in crime, our, our leader extraordinaire, the one who brought us all together, Dr. Cheryl Dixon. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, um, I've been saying lately the word super excited. So if you hear me say that a lot, I don't know where it's coming from, but I'm super excited um, about this, uh, particularly this event, uh, to hear about youth to hear from the youth, to actually understand some of the things that they've been going through, to hear their voices, and to bring this fabulous panel of people that are doing work in Kalamazoo that makes such a difference. And that's why we call this the village, bringing the village together to hear the youth, what the youth needs, and to actually be resources and to act, uh, be able to, at the end, um, really see how we can collaborate, because a lot of us are doing a lot of work, and for each of us to hear about the work that's being done, ways that we can actually collaborate and together to actually do more, and really about filling the gaps. What are some of the gaps? What are the concerns that families have? And what are some of the concerns really particularly that young people have? As a pediatrician, I see patients in this community. I am a transplant. I am from New Jersey, but I love this community. And so um, I really care about the youth and I care about families. So I'm, I'm super excited that we all have come together for this you know, series to actually hear you speak and build this village. Thank you so much, Dr. Dixon. And for those of you that are joining us from the med school, from WMed, um, I believe Andrew is on, he'll be taking down everyone's name who's in attendance tonight so that you'll be able to receive any additional credits that you were um, looking for. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is, is aware that you will be duly noted, your participation here is noted. I also wanna specifically welcome some of our um, student organization representatives that are here from some of our um, student orgs from our College of Health and Human Services, welcome. We are so glad that you could be here, and we will make sure that you have access to this recording after tonight's session. Um, without any further ado, let's go ahead and just jump into some questions. Um, the first thing that I like to do is we'll start off asking these questions directed to our students that are on the panel, but then I'd like to also offer up for um, our panelists just a kind of popcorn response and, and share some of your thoughts and your experiences too. Um, so please let us know, how have the recent events of COVID, deaths in the black community, violence um, within locally, right here within our own Kalamazoo community, impacted you? So I think it has impacted the community by like some of our loved ones dying and like everybody's seeing every day now, somebody gets shot this day, somebody gets shot the next day. People think it's not cool in black community like people's not getting their right rights they want, then like something that happened a long time ago is happening and occurring again. And people shouldn't have, go, shouldn't have to go through this and then young kids looking up to the older kids like what is going on? Like they look up for us to an example, they want us to change communities so they won't have to grow up with this. Like my sister, she's scared to go outside sometimes because of what's happening and going. Kids shouldn't have to be going through that because the community shouldn't have to be like this. Thank you, Renal. Thank you for lifting that up. Um, Brianne, is there something that you would like to add to that? Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I was just going to say that it's definitely been a dynamic shift completely with, you know, first starting off with COVID with, you know, we're, we're not allowed to, you know, socialize with our friends as much as we can. We have to wear a mask going everywhere, you know, we're on online schooling now. We don't have that interaction in the classroom that like a lot of us, a lot of kids depend on, you know, a lot of kids depend on that meal, that breakfast and that lunch. And I know they were doing a lot of things for that, but, you know, also a lot of kids like to go to school, that's their getaway from, you know, things going on at home. And like me, like I, my, my music teacher, Miss Pellegrino, like going into that classroom every day and just like getting that hour of music. Like that was like, that was getting me through my day and I still get it, but it's just like a different dynamic, you know? So I guess it's just, it's just really tough. And then everything surrounding like all the protests and Black Lives Matter it's just like really sad that after like 400 years, like the same stuff is still happening and you know, there's no change about it. And, and like, you know, the election, everything going on with the election, like how close it is, it's just, it's kind of sickening, you know, like that people can really, you know, like advocate for this man. So it's just, I feel like a lot of us, I've talked to my friends like throughout this whole quarantine, you know, online school. And I feel like we're all just confused. Like, we don't know what to do, especially seniors. We're like, we, we kind of lost our whole entire senior year. So, you know, we're still hoping for, you know, a little bit at the end, the last trimester. But it's just, it's, I think just everybody's confused. And I think that's one thing that we can all agree on. We all are going through the same exact thing in, in terms of quarantine and the whole COVID situation. So I think it's definitely helps to have, like, people around you, like, you know, to talk to, like, through your phone or through email or text, so. Thank you so much. You lifted up so much there. Thank you so much, Rayon. Um, it appears that maybe Ontario has just been able to join us. So, Ontario, if you are able to come off of mute and introduce yourself, we would love for our listening audience to be able to meet you. My name is Orlando. I'm from the Kalamazoo area. I go to Phoenix High School. I'm an honor student. And after high school, I want to get into the big business. I'm not sure if you heard the first question that we were asking, but um, the first question we just kind of wanted to ask all of our students tonight was, you know, given the recent events with COVID, deaths in the black community and the violence, um, that's been going on right here in our own local community. You know, how has that impacted you? It hasn't really impacted me. Well, COVID hasn't because I stay in the house uh, 24-7. And you asked about the deaths in the community? Yes, sir. Well, I don't really know too much about you know, what's, what's been going on because everything has been crazy. I don't hear too, I don't hear too much about it. I got you. I got you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask another question um, to some of our kind of youth support systems and our youth providers. Um, I mean, as you hear, you know, just the different challenges that some of our youth have been experiencing or there's been like kind of a wide variety of experiences. Um, what has our community been doing to really support our youth during this time? So I can start this one off, Lutara. Um, I you. know, for instance, um, protests come to mind and Breon touched on it. And uh, working in clinical mental health field, um, Four words stood out to me with her, and confused um, is a very big one. Um, that scared feeling as well as that socialization. Um, you know, oftentimes we forget that children are, are like sponges, and they're built on that socialization factor. Um, and so one thing that I know that we've been trying to do as far as the protest is to take that scared and confused feeling away from the children that are impacted locally. Um, so our group got involved with uh, participating in protests since the summertime, um, now hosting our very own protests downtown. Um, and it's important for us to make sure that the youth are involved and um, we provide uh, boards and markers and activities for them to participate in 
to be able to express whatever it is that they're feeling. Um, I think it's a matter of validating their voice and their feelings and their current emotions and walking them through it to understand it. Um, so I know that that has helped um, a number of our youth that have been active um, with us in the community, particularly one little boy, his name is Caden, who has been uh, participating every week. And um, unfortunately he is, um, he's Mexican and he lost, um, He's trying to understand the whole ICE situation. Um, I think that that's a, a hard thing for him to understand. And one of the things that stood out for me was that um, he told us that we are helping him find his strength and his voice so that way he can advocate for his own culture. And I think that that's important for us to uh, maneuver and navigate um, as resources to youth in the community. So um, I hope that, Brian, I would love to meet you and maybe um, help navigate that confused feeling that you also have been, um, you know, dealing with. Um, but I think it's important for us to just validate our youth um, that are active in the community and, and make sure that they feel included and uh, just instill uh, the tools that, that are needed, such as, you know, explaining the whole election process to them. That was another thing that we've done, as well as um, breaking down the proposals, um, which I do feel like we failed in whole at, from my stance, of uh, being able to explain what a proposal is and what the proposals mean. As a community, um, a lot of people do not understand the dynamics of the proposals behind it. Um, so some of our other youth supports, um, Nikinga, can you, can you share a little bit? Or Stacey, you're about to go. Go ahead, Stacey. Oh, I was going to um, talk about, um, so with Kid Network, we uh, work very intentionally in making, uh, trying to make all of our spaces as youth driven as possible, using youth leadership councils, youth advisory councils to really um, plan programming. We held, um, back in August, we held a youth-led action Friday where youth developed six um, agenda items that they want youth to work on. And so we have been mobilizing our youth um, leadership coordinator in, in, in those different areas. But really, it sounds like to us that youth want us to make these these spaces for them to, to have their voices heard, intentional and structural and, 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 and be often. And so um, we've been trying to do that. Uh, we've been doing that with the Youth Mobility Fund Ambassadors Program as a partnership with KPS, Kid Network, and the... Um, ah! EFE, it's not EFE, e, mm. uh, uh, foundation. Foundation for Excellence. Thank you, Nikki, <laughs> for that. And so, um, you know, we really want to, to lift up and, and, and make space for youth to tell us what's wrong so that we can engage the resources we have connection to to fix it. Um, and we do that by really lifting up youth voice and our programming checking ourselves on adultisms, the things that we think that we do um, and we decide just because we're the grown up, right? And we've done it before and we know what's right when um, I think what I heard, you know, everyone say here is that youth have a lot to bring, right? They're not buckets that need to be filled up. They're um, experiments that need to be picked apart so we can get all the good stuff, right? And, and help them bring out all of their good stuff. And so, um, that's the work that Kid Network supports by working with programs who work with youth. Thank you so much for that, Stacey. I'm seeing rounds of applause everywhere. So those intentional, meaningful spaces. Um, Sakia or Nakinga, would you like to share? And then we'll go to Mo, Reverend Mo. So one thing that I want to touch on that, Brian, uh, hopefully I'm saying it right, um, lifted up is being a senior and kind of losing that senior year. And so we um, are now seeing the second class of students kind of lose out on some, um, some pivotal moments, some pivotal time to plan. And there's just a lot of uncertainty and we're not on, at the resource part yet, but I, I know that has changed the way we have looked at things at the Primus. And we have one of our high school coaches for Lori Norix, Melissa on, um, Melissa Nesbitt on, but we know that we've had to do more outreach to students in this time to say, hey, what, what is your planning or do you need some time off? Do you even understand if that's possible? We know that this is traumatic right now. 
our college students, we've had to reshift and say like, mm, it's, it's going to be hard to think about English 101 and poli sci and all those other things when there's so much uncertainty and loss and pain in the world. So I want to lift that up that we have kind of thought a little differently about um, our outreach and, and what we share about what folks know about the promise. But this time of COVID, um, this time of racial pandemic has also lifted up the education equities that we have known have been there all the time. It's just shed more light on them. So we're in a virtual space and time knowing that kids are in homes where parents can't read to them, um, can't log on and help them with things. And so I am just thankful for the many teachers. I watched my baby cousins today uh, do online school and I was like, oh my God, if I was a teacher, I would have lost my mind trying to call on everybody and mute and all, all the things. So just thankful for teachers for um, not giving up and being able to stick in there, but also learning hubs. And so at The Promise, we don't have a site right now for folks to come in, but we've been supporting the learning hubs in the community. The folks that are saying, come in here, get a snack, um, get, lay in, in the corner on a beanbag and, and free your mind and, and get some help with this math or whatnot. So I'm um, just thankful for some resources that are available, but also it highlights the inequities that have been there. And post COVID, we really have to think about how do we continue to come together as a community and, and bridge the gap. So it doesn't take something like a pandemic for us to really work together to solve things. Thank you, Nikinga. So I would just share, um, you know, the school district, we're what folks might call that first shift um, to support students during the school day um, or during the day. And when everything abruptly shut down in March, those of us who consider ourselves hardcore student advocates or child advocates really started thinking about what were all of the corners and nooks and crannies? Like, what do we have to, what gaps do we need to fill to ensure that every one of our children get what they need? And quickly the district realized that we didn't have all of the answers. So trying to connect with the, uh, the promise, connecting with CIS, connecting with um, Kid Network um, and other agencies and resources in the community, uh, Griffin Place, <clears throat> uh, the court system, um, connecting with as many other of those partners that we could to try to ensure that we uh, developed support systems for our children in ways that were unconventional. We, can't, we couldn't continue to do school the way we've done it. So we had to reach out to figure other ways to meet the needs of all of our students. And as Ikea said, the, the pandemic or the abrupt shutdown, along with all of the racial unrest, really points to a lot of the inequities that we know we, we have across our school district, not just here in Kalamazoo, but across the country. Every, every school district is grappling with meeting the needs um, of all of our learners. So <clears throat> what we, what we have been really working hard at since March is collaborating with all of these resource agencies, changing our paradigm as K-12, um, as a K-12 institution, and looking for more creative ways to meet the needs of children. The good news is um, the financing of how school lunch is delivered and counting of students, all of those things kind of changed in our favor, if you will. So it gave us a lot more latitude as a school district. A lot of times um, those things that folks wished school districts could do right away, they don't understand that there's usually some policy or procedure or something that makes it work in the way that it does. So with this happening, um, the, the state budget and all kinds of other things that are typically not um, as flexible were highly flexible for us to be able to serve all of our children and make sure that they didn't miss a meal and make sure that we could provide devices for everyone. Um, kudos to Kalamazoo Public Library and uh, the city of Kalamazoo for the hotspots that we were able to give out to all of our children. Like what, what we have seen is such a, um, a village mentality and all hands on deck. Um, and so I'm really very proud to serve in the city of Kalamazoo as well as in the district because I, I'm amazed at how quickly our professionals were able to turn things around and get um, online school happening and almost in a seamless manner. Um, I, I watched a couple of kindergarten online classes and was absolutely floored at the creativity and the engagement um, you know, and, and, and doing so with, with 
ease, you know, and comfort. Mm -hmm. The yeah. other thing that I think uh, the school district has really been working to do is, and for the last six years, we've really embraced this concept of uh, culturally responsive education. But on top of that, now we have been, we've been really focused and intentional on um, tackling equity and ensuring that everyone in our organization understands equity and is ready to do the hard work at um, really taking a hard look at our own biases and talking about how do we change our procedures and practices um, so that every kid um, that walks through our doors or logs online <laughs> feels safe and engaged in our setting. And so we've done some really intentional PDs around equity, around culture and climate, um, training and walking right along staff through the multi-tier systems of support process so that we don't just focus on how well kids can read and write, but we're also focusing on the social and emotional aspect of the child as well. So spending specific time once a week uh, for an hour just on social emotional learning. Hey, how are you? Checking in with kids. How are you? Um, what's different? What's new? Um, how, what help do you need? What resources do you need? Um, hasn't always been the way K-12 has operated, especially once you get to the secondary grades. But now that we are in this space and we understand that the whole child even calls on us to be responsible for that part of the student, we've really been um, intentional about creating opportunities uh, for kids to, to share, to learn, and to grow, um, to strengthen their own social and emotional needs. Again, reaching out to partners because we don't always have all of the answers. And so um, asking for support and looking for grant dollars and you know, really just engaging in ways that we haven't done before um, just to make sure that we are reaching uh, all of our students. Um, so. Um, yeah, the, the district has done, um, has, has started to do some really different things, but I think the district has always been um, intentional about changing with the students that we have um, sitting in front of us every day. Thank you, Nikinga. Um, Reverend Mel? Yes, um, very powerful comments from everyone. Um, as a church, we are supporting youth, um, kind of like everyone else would like be in the village and giving youth outlets to really speak their frustrations and, and what they're going through and um, giving them godly and very positive guidance to navigate through this, through everything. Um, also staying in constant communication with families, I think is very important with checking in on families. How are you doing? And a lot of our work is we support youth by also supporting parents. And that is a major focus of ours right now is ensuring that parents have everything they need. Um, they, they have the support they need, you know, and whatever they need to make sure they are pouring into their children to the best of their abilities. So, so those are some of the things we're doing. We meet on a weekly basis. We call it our youth gatherings just to give youth and parents a time to talk, learn, have a good time, and see some of their, their friends and meet new friends, right? I mean, I think that is so important. Um, we have seen some of our youth who attend our church, you know, um, when COVID hit, it impacted their behavior, it impacted their life, right? Because um, the church, we provide a moral compass we have certain relationships and those people were checking in on their behavior. They know they can expect every week us to be checking in with them like, hey, what's going on? So when COVID hit and that personal touch went away, you know, our, we had to switch it up and change some things. So, so yeah, so that's what we're doing. I don't want to be um, too long, but uh, so, yeah, that's how we're supporting our youth. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing um, that those uh you know, comments and things that you're doing. Um, I want to say that uh, what I can just say from the medical end of what we were doing and what we were seeing is similar. We were really just trying to ensure that we are still here and we're still able to take care of the, you know, the children for their health needs and families for their health needs, really trying to help with dispelling or really getting messages out about how to be safe and prevention, kinds of things of prevention. Um, what kinds of trying to really work with um, 
getting testing, how to get testing, those kind of things for COVID. But as, as in, in seeing the, the, the uh, parents, you know, in the practice, I could see the concerns with the kids, you know, because this was a whole new thing for them with the, you know, with the virtual and the social isolation and the differences of the things that now in the very beginning, you know, it was a challenge. You know, we actually saw, um, we were trying to do some of our programs that we do, um, medical students, and we have a lot of programs that we do for pathway programs that, you know, pipeline programs to actually add to the education. And we like really were trying to see ways that we could restructure those programs so that we could still offer, you know, the things that we are, are bringing, which are important for the education and well-being for the youth as well. So the concern I've had and, you know, um, really happened to see the KPS has really stepped up and really, really the programming and also the out of school programming has made such a difference to have places where youth can go to access online and have mentors, you know, have that, you know, people there, you know, that can actually help guide them during the day for their studies. Huge. So important. So really seeing um, Kalamazoo step up. Um, with the out of school, the partnerships, the collaborations with the hubs really makes a difference for the well-being, mental well-being and physical well-being uh, for kids and for families. So um, thank you, everyone, for sharing. Thank you so much for filling us in and providing us some of that um, background, Dr. Dixon. I'd like to take this part of the conversation back to our student leaders. Um, cause we don't, and I know we've got a few more students on the call. So even if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself, we welcome you to please chime in as you see fit. Um, but one question that we would like to know is, um, you know, as you've heard, we've heard what is happening, what our schools are doing, what our churches are doing, what our community organizations are doing. How are these changes impacting you? How is it impacting or supporting, improving your learning? You're coping. Um, how are you feeling about that socially? Because you shared with us some of the challenges. Are you finding that some of these supports are beneficial? And how? Um, I feel like um, like the SEL, social emotional learning, I feel like in some of my classes that has been like really helpful. But then again, I feel like in others, they kind of just, some of my teachers use it like just for like more like to discuss classwork rather than like how we're doing if that makes any sense. Cause I feel like social emotional learning, it should be checking in on our mental health. And I feel like some of the teachers are kind of maybe just confused on that or didn't get the memo, but I feel like it would just be a lot, <laughs> I feel like it would just be a lot more valuable if like we use that time like for mental health. Like I know in my choir class, like she, we always have these little um, sticky, there's this program that we do sticky notes on and we like, we answer questions and we talk about our favorite music and we, she asks us how our day is and we always check in. And like, even when we were in class, we did the call map, we did our meditation, like at least like twice a week. So like we got that, you know, time to check in with ourselves and with everybody else and to share like some things that were going on. And like, I feel like that's kind of missing. So I feel like in a way, I personally don't feel that supported like with this online school. And then um, like, as far as like the work goes, I kind of I kind of don't feel like I'm learning anything. I kind of feel like I'm just like doing assignments and turning them in. And like, honestly, me two years ago, that'd be my dream. Like, just give me a sign it, turn it in. But now that I'm like older and I'm matured, I'm like, I kind of like, I'm about to go to college soon. Like, I kind of, I want to like, I want to feel like I'm learning something. I want to feel like I'm being educated. So it kind of doesn't feel like that anymore. So. Thank you for lifting that. So if we go from our senior down to our freshman, um, Rennell, what, what have been your experiences? This is your first time in high school. Oh, well, it's been different. Like I'm still adapting to it. Like I wouldn't, I'd rather be still be in school because I think like you could get more help. Like now and now stuff, it's like it's not that much help because the teacher's not always going to be there, and the work, it's still the same. It's like getting hard. Uh, it's basically like the help and online school because like people's not used to like doing online class. And some people don't be getting the right education they need because some of them don't be doing it because they don't feel like getting up on time. 
and doing their work and turning it in. But I, I like this more because uh, it gives you more time to space stuff out and stuff. Excellent. Thank you. Orlando, what were some of your thoughts? Um, I like online I like, I like online learning because you know, I get to um do stuff on my own time. My daughter concurs with you as I well. Wanna, I want to push him a little bit. I want him to share a little bit more about his experience with online learning and how he's kind of forced himself into um, completing more classes here in this city. So Orlando, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I've gotten better grades by doing online learning. I passed more classes. I finished the first, so what is it, first half of school with uh, good grades. Congratulations, Orlando. That that's quite an accomplishment. So when you say you finished the first half of school, um, what year? I'm sorry. Could you repeat for us again what year in school you were? Oh, I'm in uh, 12th grade. So as a senior, so when you're saying you finished your first half of school, are you talking about your credits for your first semester? Or are you talking about? Um, could you add some context to that first half of school for those of us that may not quite understand the online or the curriculum you're using? Yes, um, my first, um, my credits for the first half. Uh, I got um, all of them. So if I'm understanding you right, you just said that you have completed the credits for your first semester of school. So that would be like two marking periods together in one marking period. Is, is it, am I understanding that correctly? Um, I don't think that. Nikinga, could you, could you help him out a little bit? Can you kind of put that into context? Because I'm extremely proud of you for your accomplishments, but I just want to make sure that I'm sharing with everyone else. And I think I can see a head nod. I'm going to ask Mr. Hill to jump in here. For six weeks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, he's telling me that he's very nervous and shy. And so we're going to respect that. And I'm, I'm coaching him that you could do this. Uh, nonetheless, uh, he is a leader in that area. He has completed in the first six weeks, so our, our trimesters are 12 weeks. In the six weeks, he has focused on his uh, classes and his grades that he's completed all his classes. And then he had the nerve to email me, Mr. Hill, I'm done with my classes. So I go into the system to see how much time he's spending on uh, his online classes, like all day. So legitimately, he has put his time while he's home into his, his uh, academics, his studies. So I can't hold him up. So I send him another class and he's actively engaged in that. So he's ahead of the, the curve, basically, of what's happening. And um, so he's fell in love with computers. He wants to go into IT. Uh, that that was part of his nervousness. Uh, he he wants to go into IT, so he's found uh, a passion in this type of learning to make it work for him. Did I do okay, Orlando? Did I do okay? Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, Orlando. We are all collectively so proud of you. I don't know if you can see the chat right now, yeah, I can but. See. You can Thank see, you. The, so you see like all the love that you're getting right now. All right. Yes. I mean, wow. Okay. We're trying to be like you when we grow up. Um, <laughs> so I guess another question, and, and I'm not going to keep putting you on the spot. So I'm going to, I'm going to take the spotlight off of you, Orlando, but for any of our other students, I thought I saw another student on the call. Um, Alexi, are you a student? Nope. I work for the calendar promise. Well, praise the Lord. So <laughs> Alexi, I need you to answer this life. question for me. I need, I know in a different life, a different life. Um, but I need, to, but Alexia, since you work for the Calvary Promise, um, I know that Sakia was explaining to us that um, the Calvary Promise has been actively, um, you know, really reaching out to students even more than usual. To and I thought she mentioned you, but I'm not sure who it was that was doing that. Um, but 
but that you've been actively reaching out to our, our seniors to really bring them in and bring them along in this process, even more so than what you've seen in the past. Can you kind of share with us what those experiences have been like and, and what else do we need to be collectively doing to help our seniors and our juniors as they're preparing for this next part of their, their journey? Yeah, so Melissa, I think you're on the call. So Melissa is actually our pathway coach at Lori Norris High School. I actually don't work with high school students. I work with students after high school. So Melissa, if you want to lift that up, I don't know if you can hear or if you're connected. Yes, okay. I can hear. Okay, so normally I would be working with high school seniors, but I found myself working with freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors all virtually. So I have an open office space where you can come in and you can complete college apps, you can get help with your FAFSA, you can start your scholarship essays. And I'm just finding that I'm kind of out of touch because I'm not getting that, that human interaction that I would normally have where students can come down, sit in my class or sit in my office and just pour it all out. So that's what I'm missing and I do need help with that. But as I'm getting all these juniors in they're like hey can you connect me with howard university admissions rep and i'm like uh yeah i work for the kalamazoo promise i could definitely assist you with getting into any public university in michigan but you know so now i'm getting those out of the ordinary questions but it's making me feel good because i'm actually fulfilling these students needs so again like i'm not having that one-on-one -on -one interaction i'm feeling feeling a little empty but i'm just when i'm reaching out i'm reaching out to the whole entire Lloyd Norris class and I'm getting responses. So as opposed to just the 275 seniors I was working with, now because my email communications are going out to a larger body, I'm getting those that feedback and that response. That's fantastic. Can I send you some, um, can I send you a Porter Central sophomore? Oh, sorry, sorry, that's, that's <laughs> personal. That's, that's, that's on a whole other conversation. The Kinga said, no, I can't do that. Okay, all right, okay, sorry. I, that, that was just a personal side. Um, so back to our students, um, you know, you've shared with us some of your, you know, your, your true feelings and experiences, you know, both your, your successes and some of your struggles with this online learning environment. So the next question that I have for you is, how are you finding strength and support at this time? So let's start with our students, and then I want for everybody on our panel, to answer that question. How are you finding strength and support at this time? I'm finding strength and support from my mom and from my um, teachers at school. Awesome, thank you, Orlando. Uh, I, find, I find my strength and support from my, my mom, my dad, my family members, and this group I'm in and the coaches at the school. Fantastic, thank you. Now you said this group that I'm in, what group are you in that were other than your parents and your teachers? So like, it's not with my teacher, but it's like with my mom. And then it's like with my friends, it's like, it's called my base, like our little group is like our, uh, it's like a brotherhood kind of, like where we talk about what's going on in the world. And then like, we went to a whole bunch of uh, protests for Black Lives Matters. Like, um, like my mom, she brought Steven Jackson down here, George Floyd's brother, and I was a part of that. And then I went to another protest. I speak that I speak. That was my first one I spoke at. And then we went to a protest in Detroit for New Era, New Era Detroit, I think is what it's called. And we did a march for that. And ever since then, we just started doing stuff. But we've been at this group for a while now. And we talk about the uh, current events. And we did recently did the uh mm. the march for Le at Lacron where they revealed the painting that they did, and we helped hand out stuff. It helped with the event. That is fantastic! Thank you so much, John. How have you been finding your strength and your support? Um, I've been. This may sound weird, but I've been kind of finding my strength and support through like reading and through like quotes. Like I have this quote wall. I like every day or every other day, like I write a quote down, like just something that I come up with, something that I need to hear to get me through the day 
or something that I read. Like I have a lot of Maya Angelou quotes on my wall. I have a lot of, <laughs> I have a, some quotes from Obama. I have a lot of good people up there. So I just try to look at it just to start my day. I have a class at 7.50 a.m. every morning. So I just try to start my day with that. And then like for my family as well, and especially my teachers at school and my mentor and class advisor, Sphere May, Miss May. Many of you may know her. She's a ball of energy. So she's been really helping me. She She's the one who introduced me to the um, Charles Warfield Scholarship. I won honorable mention for that this year. So I was really excited to be a part of that. And yeah, I wrote all those little mini essays and it was a really, it was a really powerful thing to be involved with because there are so many students that did it and just to win like even honorable mention, like I'm really grateful for that. So. Oh man, thank you so much. And thank you for also lifting up sometimes, you know, because we're all different, right? And so sometimes the way that we find our strength and, and find our, our comfort is through reading. You know, sometimes it's through other people, but sometimes it's through that, that, that experience that we find ourselves. So thank you for lifting that up. All right, panelists, you guys are on the hot seat. Popcorn time. How are you finding your strength? I'm going first. Thank you. Um, I find my strength. So I, um, I get my bucket filled being around kids and hearing you smile and, and laugh and, and getting enjoyment like that. So um, I look for opportunities to support youth. Um, Pre-COVID, Brunel is my baby, and he always going to be my baby. Um, but going out to support activities, um, serving in our Awana ministry at church. And so um, my buck has been empty, right, for COVID. And so I've been looking for intentional opportunities. So I was exact, excited to go to participate at Charlie's Place Trunk or Treat the other night. And I saw all my kids. I was so excited to see them. And so I've learned that I have to make intentional space, right, to be around youth um, because I, and then I have two granddaughters, my 10 month old granddaughter and a two month old granddaughter and ain't no sadness around them. So um, that's my joy for uh, now and how I, and they're both biracial. I always, I always bring this up. One has a black father and one has a white father and they deserve, they deserve the same exact high quality experiences wherever they go. So that's my fight. That's my joy. And um, I'm excited about these young people because they're going to change this whole world. I'm geeked about it. I'll jump in. Stace and Stace. Um, and Brianna, I'll go with you with uh, the reading. And so every morning when I get up, I, I'm a person of faith. So I read my devotion and just that spark that, you know, just starting from the heart, just thankful for breath every day as we're living with this pandemic. Um, like TC had mentioned, just the music, just the quiet, absorbing all of that. So just encouraging everyone reference the self-care. But what gives me strength is, again, um, listening to you all, like Stay said, and just hearing the joy and just whatever you're putting on the table, just so we understand and connect these generations and be here for you however we can. So I appreciate that. Thank you. So I will piggyback off of um, you, Stacey, and say that self-care has been my turn to during this time. I'm someone that lives alone and I do good with that space, right? But when you have like 24 hours times a million weeks, I'm like, oh goodness, I need to hear another voice, right? So um, podcasts, uh, full out concerts. I've got a Bluetooth speaker. I know my neighbors are tired of hearing me with my uh, gospel concerts every, <laughs> every morning, but I do my concerts. I do audible. And then when I do feel like I need those touches that I can't necessarily get in person from friends, there's a podcast group where I meet with other women. Um, and so each week we listen to a podcast and then we come together um, once a week to talk about what we've heard. So that way I get another perspective on it might be finances, it might be health, it might be relationships but it just gives me those other touches and then we just compile all the podcasts and share them so i'll go oh i'm sorry tc are you ready to go no <laughs> so um for me my see ya so that's part of my my son my my 16 year, 17 year wait how old are you boy 16 16 my bad so my 16 year old, is he is, um, I get my energy from him and he has a core group of friends that he's played sp several sports with since he's been uh, a student at Maple Street or actually Winchell, even, you know, just kids that he's grown up with. And um, 
he uh, going from Winchell to, to Maple and now at Norks. So those boys, um, we have not abided by COVID guidelines. They are constantly at my house. Um, <laughs> and I will not guarantee that we always check temperatures. But it's because I have to, I, the, I hear what's going on in their lives, especially after the death of uh, a murder of George Floyd. There was just something about my need to be around these boys, these young black boys, and just listening to their laughter in the basement and their engagement and them eating, eating all my food in the refrigerator and, you know, expecting me to cook breakfast on Saturday mornings. Like that, that is, see you, honey, drive safe. That is my, and that right there is another thing he's driving. But anyway, that is my, like, I get so excited watching them and being so engaged with listening to them. And they, they will, they'll text me out of the blue and say, I love you, Ma, or just thinking about you and all of them, not just my own, but all of them. And that, that gives me energy um, to continue to fight for whatever it is I need to fight for in the school district to make things okay for all of those children. Cause they range in race, they range in age, they range in socioeconomic status. And, but when they hear, when they're here, they're all just, they're all just mine. Right. And so um, that does give me joy. And then also my faith life, someone mentioned earlier, um, I am uh, constantly engaged in my church. I'm so excited and proud and honored to be a member of my church because um, throughout this pandemic, we haven't skipped a beat. And our members have found a way to be engaged um, every day of the week, just about. I, I, I pretty much think there's something online for us every day of the week. And so um, having that word and people holding me spiritually accountable, um, all of that means a lot to me. And that helps to get me prepared for the fight that I know that is waiting for me every day when, when we go to work. So um, that, that's how I feel. My, and, and for most people, that sounds like a lot of work sometimes, but it really is just a lot of fun for me to, to um, be around those kids and, and listening to the word and then preparing myself for, for the next day. So thank you. Thank you so much. TC? So I'm going to piggyback off of everyone, um, you know, coming from a, a parent standpoint that is not only essential uh, employed and raising two children on my own. Uh, I lean on two friends that uh, educate my children throughout the week. So um, that's where I find that strength and that support from. It's very challenging um, to pack up a child every, every day to go to a different place to get their virtual learning. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that experience and, and just being able to have that support system to lean on to make sure that I'm still working to make ends meet for my family. But outside of that, you know, a lot of times I sit back and I think about the many hats that I wear. And I realize that no matter how busy I am or no matter how many projects I tend to take on, I find my biggest strength and support by just staying busy and being proactive and giving back to the community. And it sounds so crazy, but I am my most happiest self knowing that I am doing something for someone other than myself. And, um, you know, from being in school full time, um, doing a double master's, uh, full time parent, um, orchestrating protests every, every week, twice a week to um, aiding with getting people to the voting polls just recently and now advocating heavy for mental health. Um, I'm in the process of trying to really come up with something that can help strengthen the mental health perspective in our community. And uh, I just find myself so happy just not stopping. And I know that that's like sometimes really hard because self-care is very important, but I really find my strength and support just giving back and, and knowing that I'm being of use to someone else that needs it more than myself at this point. So I agree with everything that everyone said, and I just wanted to add to that. Awesome. All right, I'll go ahead and jump in. So um, I draw my strength from my wives, you know, my wife, um, my one and a half year old daughter, like those are my wives. So it's the reason why I do what I do is for them. Um, and my family, and um, also the youth and families I serve. You know, I oftentimes, I will say it in a heartbeat, 
you know, these kids, um, these teenagers, these babies, they have taught me so much more than I have taught them. And they have um, made me a better man, you know, through our conversations, through the dialogue, through all the trips and the laughter and the fun times. And even in this moment, seeing them talk with them, seeing their growth, right, um, really gives me strength. And um, of course, my church family, you know, um, gives me strength as well. Um, God, the scriptures. And, and one thing that really gives me strength, probably more than anything, is my quiet time. Um, my quiet time where it's just me, um, a Bible, a notebook, and a pen. And I just journal and I bleed my emotions out. I bleed my fears out. I bleed my frustrations out. Um, I cry my tears on that paper and I really get everything out, you know, um, before God. And I just write and I write and I write. And it feels so great to do that. And I feel so clear headed and ready to um, face everything I have to face in the world and to um, operate in my purpose and impact other people's lives. So um, that's probably the number one thing um, that's really helped me is my quiet time. And that um, if I don't have that quiet time, I find myself weak. So I really need that time, you know, just to write and uh, think and um, just kind of be in my own thoughts. So that really gives me strength. Thank you so much, Reverend Mo. Did I miss anybody? I don't think I missed any of our panelists. I um, I thank you for for sharing how some of your strategies for what you're actually doing um, to find strength and support. Because when we talk about um, our youth and when we talk about how we um, support our youth, there's two things connected to that. And number one is we can't effectively support our youth if our buckets are empty. So we have to continue to fill ourselves so that we can then turn around and fill them. And, and for our youth that are on the call, I thank you for sharing with us the different strategies that you're using because, I mean, we're helping each other right now. Um, we're, we're all going through something. We're all experiencing something. I don't know about you, but I mean, some of us are just feeling some kind of way right now. So um, what I, I'll just I'll just be transparent, you know, um, I, I'm feeling a heaviness right now. So what I would like for us to do is um, what I'd really like for us to do is, is TC and I've kind of been, you know, going back and forth with this saying, how are we going to do this? But I think that this might be an appropriate time for us to actually put some of this into action. So we're going to have like a centering exercise. TC is going to lead us in a centering exercise during tonight's call so that we can just kind of, you know, bring ourselves together. Miss Candace is going to pre play a little bit of music for us. TC is going to take us through this process so that we can, we can see it, experience it, feel it, but also share in this moment together. So TC, I'm going to turn things over to you. Okay, so bear with me, please. I'm a little shy myself. Um, but uh, I, I do want to follow up with this exercise with just a few benefits once it's over. Okay, everybody. So one of our techniques in uh, mental health and uh, dealing with any person that is dealing with high anxiety or stress, uh, we like to utilize what we call a moment of silence, a meditation period. So I want you to get as comfortable as possible um, in your chair or however it is that you're sitting. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to try to clear your mind. And I want you to just listen to the music as I speak. So I want you to visualize yourself in the center of the universe. It can be taking you back to a happy moment, a happy memory, or at some point in your life that brought you peace. Just listen to the sound of the music as you drift back to that space or that moment that just slows your brain down. Think back to the smell, the taste, 
what you were touching. And I want you to be present in that moment. I want you to take deep, slow breaths. I want you to inhale. And I want you to exhale. And I want you to be present in that moment. Deep, slow breaths as you find that moment. Now, in one word, if anybody could just chime in and just tell me what it is that you felt in one word within that five-minute 
alone time? I feel re relaxed. Anyone else? Peaceful. Peaceful. I think I I kind of like talked over somebody. I don't know who that was, but happy. Centered. Centered. I like that. Um, clarity. I like that one too. So I love doing this particular exercise, um, especially with children. Oftentimes, um, they don't get to embrace those quiet moments. Um, unfortunately, our world has created such chaos in the middle of what we thought was normal, right? And I like to do this exercise to reinforce the thought that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not know what to feel and it's okay to not understand what is supposed to be normal. Um, I think it's very important for us to take time out and utilize just a moment of silence. Five minutes sometimes to me feels like forever. And sometimes it's a space where I just shut my brain down and really go back to that moment that really brought clarity to my life. Um, the benefits of having this moment of silence is not only beneficial for your mental and your nerves, but it helps lower your blood pressure. Um, it also restores balance to, to your your body. Um, it gives your mind a sense of like free of doubt. Um, it get, like gives you con confidence and motivation. Um, one of the biggest things for me, it reduces my anxiety. So this is really important for people that suffer from high anxiety, especially with unknowns. Me, I hate the unknown of not knowing, especially during the times that we live in. Um, Another thing with the pandemic and, and the isolation and the lack of socialization, it helps with depression. So as children, I think it's very important for us to just sometimes slow down those quick moments of wanting to get on a game or uh, just be in the moment and, and not know what, what we want, but utilize that moment of silence and bring some type of calm to the storm that's surrounding you. So. Um, I hope that helped everybody and thanks for letting me do it. Thank you so much, TC. Um, and I know some of you might say, okay, why in the world would you have a centering moment in the middle of a conversation about youth? And I have to say that the reason that I thought that it was, it was twofold. One, just looking across the screen, and looking at many of your faces, I could see I could see a heaviness that was over a lot of your faces and that was in your presence and in your space. So you were here, but some of you weren't all the way here. And I get it because there's a lot going on right now. So sometimes we just have to say, you know what, let's take a, let's take five minutes, let's regroup, and let's come back together. And I think that not only is it important for us to be able to have that conversation um, um, with each other, but it's important for us to be able to model what that looks like for our youth. And so as TC was saying, she frequently does this with youth. So sometimes when we're in our spaces, when we're in the midst of providing the support again for the youth, it's important for us to also have something very concrete that we can do or that we can offer with them um, to, to refocus ourselves. Now, with that being said, I really want to kind of turn our conversation a little bit and focus a bit more how the challenges, the struggles, the stresses, how those might manifest medically and physically with our youth. And so this time, I'm actually going to kind of toss this part over to Dr. Dixon, our, our pediatrician, um, our leader extraordinaire, um, to kind of let, let's pull that into full circle because I think that when we think about providing supports and services to youth and as youth, um, we don't always realize the manifestation of the stress of this trauma. So, Dr. Dixon, can you can you and and Andrew can can you guys help to bring that in? Yeah, actually, I was in the process of actually just uh, typing in the, uh, a response to this mindfulness meditation moment. 
uh, it speaks to what um, Brian was saying. Brian was saying earlier about that having that social, um, you know, that check in, and really having that check in, like how how are you? You know, it gives you a opportunity to think about ways to incorporate that in to actually give those moments of quiet. We don't think to incorporate that in. Uh, we actually would thinking about even doing that with our medical students in classes to actually incorporate that in to actually have those moments of silence and those meditative moments because it actually has been shown everything TC says it actually does slow your heart rate it actually helps you to try to like you know whatever things are actually firing you know they're causing you to have elevated blood pressure elevated heart rate elevated respiratory rate and then you can't focus it keeps it calms all that down and just think about when we talk about trauma it's like think about having that on a daily basis, the things that are happening on a daily basis.